listening to Making Data Simple, where we make the world of data effortless, relevant, and yes, even fun. Uh, this is a special podcast today. Mm -hmm. uh, I am back in IBM, the IBM T Toronto lab. That's where a lot of our analytics products are made, including DB2, which is one of my favorites. Um, and interestingly enough, we're back with you again, Tunmei. Thank you. Tunmei Bakshi. So, so welcome. Thank you. I, um, I've, I've actually got to keep notes myself because you're into so many things, <laughs> it's hard for me to keep track. But I've got it here, and, and we'll get through it. Uh, the one thing I, I want to say before I be, uh, really begin, because I don't want to forget it before we end, I want to thank our podcast producers, which is Liam, Fatima, and uh, Kate for doing this. And there's a whole team in Toronto that have supported this event, so I appreciate it. Um, welcome back, man. Thank you. Glad to be back. How Absolutely. Absolutely great. Um, in fact, uh, actually, what's happening uh, right now, the reason that I'm at this office uh, is actually I'm doing my internship right now with IBM, uh, so I'm part of the team. And in fact, uh, for the past like nine years that I've been working with technology, uh, I've always been doing this either you know, on my own as an open source project, uh, and I've never really reported to anyone. I've never had like a manager. Uh, and it, it's actually well, really ready. fun. It is actually really fun working with Steve. Uh, he's here right now, Steve Martinelli, uh, and a few, of course a few other people on the team. Mark is here right now. Uh, they're absolutely great. It's, 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 it's a pleasure working with them. Fantastic. All right, we're going to have some fun here today. Absolutely. Um, what have you been doing this summer, though? Hey, but let me ask you this. What have you done fun this summer outside of coding, <laughs> outside of machine? learning, you yeah. tell me. Take so, a vacation or anything? Well, I wouldn't say vacation per se, but it was fun. So, I mean, of course, as you know, I do love uh, to go to quite a few different places for different you know, conferences, events. Uh, and so just recently, uh, in fact, last month, I was in London for a healthcare conference. I was in Germany for SAP. Uh, I was in Spain for a Keep Coding Connect developer conference, which was really fun. Uh, and just a little while ago, I was actually in New York talking to the board of McGraw Hill Education. Uh, and so that was really really exciting. I was talking about you know what they're doing with, with machine learning in the field of education, what I'm doing with IBM Watson, with machine learning in general. Uh, so I wouldn't necessarily say a vacation per se, but it was great going to New York. Uh, and in fact, while I was there, I actually got to meet uh, Rob High again, uh, CTO of IBM Watson. So we discussed a lot about what, you know, uh, what, what, what I'm doing uh, in terms of code patterns as part of this internship, and also uh, about the Watson Studio uh, and Call for Code on a new video on my YouTube channel. You're your phone sounds like a lot of work. That's what I like. <laughs> but it is fun. It's really exciting working on it. You this. get out when you go to these different places and go see mm -hmm. different sites? Oh, yeah, absolutely. In okay. fact, uh, while I was in New York, uh, I actually was able to meet one of my friends. And uh, they actually have a full on sort of like tennis uh, court in their backyard. And so, of course, my favorite sports, table tennis. Yeah. Uh, and so I was able to play, uh, you know, full sort of lawn tennis this time, which was really fun. You probably do it the right way, like stand <laughs> five feet back and really go at it. I just, you know, well, team. You know, that's how it works for me. All right, very, very good. So uh, last time we met, you also said 50% of your day is coding, still coding? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. It's still very fun. I love coding, especially when I'm working with technology like machine learning. All right, very good. And um, you, did you get a break from school this summer? Uh, yes, of course. Yeah. So, I mean, as I mentioned before, I'm homeschooled. Uh, but yes, I do get the summer vacation, and that's why I'm able to spend so much time uh, here at IBM and doing so many more of my projects. I was hoping to see your dad. He isn't here today, though. Oh, uh, right. yeah, unfortunately. Unfortunately, they're not here today. The homeschooling they're they're watching live, I'm sure. All right, good. The ho Hi, Dad. <laughs> the homeschooling seems to be working. Yes, absolutely. It, it is fun, <laughs> yeah. Very good, very good. And machine learning is still your favorite. Absolutely. All right, so I think the last time we met, it was like over five months ago, something like that. Yes, right? I believe so, yeah. So it was before Think, mm -hmm. you know, the IBM Think conference for those on the podcast. Uh, so I got to believe, I can't imagine how many times you've presented between then and now. How many times do you think that is? Well, it, it would really depend on the time, <laughs> specifically. Uh, sometimes, 10, 20? Well, you know, I, I would lean towards, you know, sort of greater than 10. Uh, but, I mean, it would be hard to specifically count because I don't keep track necessarily. Uh, but it, it is a very exciting experience doing this kind of stuff, and I love doing it. So you, you obviously had keynotes at Think. Yes, What were those keynotes? Yeah, yeah, sure. So I think I was mainly talking about, you know, a few of the different projects that I'm working on that use Watson, that use machine learning. There are actually some new technologies that I'm interested in, including, of course, Power AI Vision. I'm 
sure we all know the new Power AI Vision Toolkits that are coming out. These are really interesting. Uh, so really talking about what I'm doing in fields like healthcare. Uh, I know last time we talked about Project Cognitive, my application uh, in the field of providing artificial communication abilities, uh, my project in the field of mental health, one that we might talk about uh, in the field of drug adverse event prediction. So quite a few different projects uh, that I was basically talking about. So it's some updates, what I'm doing, and how I'm integrating Watson in these kinds of fields uh, to enable more people to use this machine learning technology to, to, to live really better lives and save as many people's lives as we can. Nice. All right. So that's a great segue. Yeah, like I said, I have my iPad given all the projects you're working on. I don't know if we even get to them all, but that's okay. I, I have categorized them into three categories, but I don't know if they're right, so you tell me if, if I'm right. So right. one is project cognitive. Yes. Now, I, I put the mental health and the drug interaction <laughs> under that umbrella, but I don't know if that's right. Would you say that's right or not? Well, they are separate projects. Uh, of course, they're all using the power of machine learning technology. They're all trying to essentially take machine learning and try and take data that people generate and make use of it so they can understand complex data, but they are separate projects, yes. All right, so all right, project cognitive, mental health, drug interaction, call for code, power AI. Yes. Is that pretty much pretty, kind of categorize it? I know there's more, but I think I got most of them, right? Yes, these are the main ones. So what I thought we'd do is we'll hit a little bit of each one of those. Some of those you gave us an update last time. Yes. So hopefully we can see where you are today, how mm -hmm. you're progressing. And then if we can, we'll open it up for, for questions at the very end from, from the, the room. That Absolutely. Makes Absolutely. All right, before we do that, another initiative that you had that I wanted to check on is last time you talked about you were the thing you love to do is spread awareness on technology mm -hmm. just period yes and you had a goal of I think it was a hundred thousand kids yes. to train on technology or introduce to technology mm -hmm. you still doing this yes absolutely I'm still working towards the goal uh, it's really exciting in fact I'm currently around 8700 people there uh, quite a few more from last time I don't remember exactly how many it was last time I was here at the podcast. I think it was like 7,000 or something yeah something around so 7,000, getting to 7,000, but now I'm around 8,700 people there working towards it again through the YouTube channel. I mean, I might have mentioned this before, uh, but I'm actually working on co-authoring a book with Rob High, uh, my mentor, mm -hmm. on IBM Watson's. So that's really fun, talking about the Watson APIs uh, and how the machine learning algorithms that actually go behind those APIs. Uh, of course, the different blogs that I author, really working towards this kind of goal through all those media. So not enough to fill your day, throw a book in, <laughs> so you can get, get some added... Uh, <laughs> All right, so I got it. But uh, so, how do you count the number of people? I mean, what, what, you said you seem very specific on the eighty-seven hundred. Mm -hmm. How do you know that it's eighty-seven hundred? I mean, what counts yeah. the, as influencing kids out yeah. there? Yeah, it really counts. Like for example, a little while ago, I was doing a workshop uh, for different students at schools. Like I was, uh, you know, for example, going to the University of Iceland, going to the University of Auckland, New Zealand, uh, going to House in London International School. Basically, whenever I go to these kinds of schools and actually help out people one-on-one -on -one with any problems that they may be having, guiding them through creating different applications, using machine learning, or even when, for example, someone reaches out to me, say, on YouTube uh, or my email and asks me a question and I'm able to help them, that's when I count another person into the list. Uh, and really, it's just you know continuing to work uh, with more and more people uh, and counting from there. So do you also do this through hackathons or competitions to, mm. to get the spirit going? Yeah, absolutely. Unfortunately, I haven't had the opportunity to be part uh, of many hackathons just yet. I mean, I'd love to, of course. Uh, but unfortunately, I haven't been to part of too many yet. Uh, I have been doing things like workshops quite similar to hackathons, except uh, I'm guiding students through actually creating these applications. Nice. So look, I'm a, a data-holic. <laughs> I've always been involved with data, as yes. long as I can remember. And I guess if there's another passion of mine, it's the client experience. Mm -hmm. But data, we're going to go into the machine learning pieces of this uh, in numerous ways. And I think I'll start with Project Cognitive, but you got to give data some love here. Um, mm -hmm. What role does data play? Because I think there's a lot of data folks out there as well. Mm -hmm. What role does data play in the modernization of technology and serving as the basis of that maturity curve to, to get to what we call the ladder to AI or driving machine learning? Absolutely. So now if we're talking about specifically machine learning technology, I mean, as you probably know, the one technology that I'm mostly interested in nowadays, at least, is machine learning technology, whether it be through the field of health Care, which is what I'm most passionate about, as you mentioned, Project Cognitive. Uh, just a quickly sort of recap in case uh, some of us weren't joining for the last podcast, Project Cognitive is essentially a project of mine where I try and provide an artificial 
communication ability to those who can't communicate naturally so they can communicate with the outside world. And the way I do that is by understanding their electroencephalogram brainwaves through custom deep learning algorithms that I develop uh, on the Watson Studio. So really what I believe is, I mean, talking about the role of data in all of this, data is the key. Data is what enables all of this to work. Without the very complex data that we're gathering from, for example, our electroencephalogram headsets, it's really impossible to be training these machine learning algorithms, especially when you're working uh, with advanced technologies like deep learning that scale excellently with data. You know, machine learning, uh, say a few years ago, say 10 years ago, uh, it worked with data very well. The more data you fed into it, the better. But eventually, it would get saturated at a certain point. You could feed in 200,000 images. It would be pretty accurate. 300,000, you wouldn't see that much of a gain. But now with deep learning technology, the best part is that the more data you give it, the better it scales with that data. Uh, and now what I'm more interested in, though, is not just the actual data, but the type of data we're collecting. You see, the type of data that's required for Project Cognitive and my other healthcare applications to work is very complex. So electroencephalogram, uh, of course, that's basically, I guess you could say, in an informal sense, uh, brain waves. But the thing is, that, that's really complex uh, data to parse. You need to be an expert neurologist uh, to even analyze a little bit of what that EEG actually means, because the thing is, we humans, we work off of the electrical impulses in our brain, but it's very difficult for us to actually take a few of those electrical impulses, graph it out, and try and understand what those impulses actually mean. That's very, very difficult for us, because that's not what we're meant to do. We're meant to work with unstructured data, like visual data, auditory data, how you're listening to me right now. Uh, and so really, the data that goes behind Project Cognitive and all of my other healthcare and really all of my other machine learning applications is the key. It's what everything else revolves around. And without being able to collect massive amounts of data and actually send it to where it's supposed to be with the least latency possible, these kinds of projects really are not possible. Uh, and so again, Project Cognitive really revolves around that data aspect and specifically using machine learning to understand really complex data. Wow. So what, <laughs> which, <Thank you>. which, <laughs> which database is the best? Just say DB2 and you'll be <laughs> It's DB2. Uh, of course it is. I knew it all along. Thank you. Very good. So um, you know, I, I want to dive down a little bit more because this is probably one of my favorite projects you're on. Last time you mentioned Boo, mm -hmm. who is yes. a quadriplegic, uh, unfortunately, mm -hmm. uh, and has Rett syndrome, if I yes. remember. Yes, Rett syndrome, yes. Yes, which is essentially problems with language, coordination, I think uh, repetitive mm -hmm. movements, that kind yes. of thing. And you were investing in, you know, working with IBM on some techn technology, like a helmet. Yes. That is essentially a wireless deep learning yeah. uh, uh, or a so, neural network within the helmet. All right, yeah. I'll let you take it for a minute, because I want to hear about it, because that is fascinating yeah. to me. Sure, thank you. So as I was mentioning about Project Cognitive uh, and what I'm doing with that technology, so yes, you're right, we're working with a girl named Boo. In fact, she lives just north of Toronto, around two hours north, uh, and she suffers from Rett syndrome. So what that means is that she can't communicate, uh, she cannot really do anything on her own, and, this, and so she's quadriplegic. Uh, and because of this, of course, because of the fact that she cannot communicate, it becomes very difficult for her to convey even really simple concepts. Like for example, let's just say she's hungry, or she's thirsty, or she wants to go to the washroom, she cannot convey those simple concepts. But Boo's mom, however, since Boo's mom has been with Boo since she was born, uh, is able to sort of understand uh, or at least give a good uh, informed guess as to what Boo's trying to communicate based off of the context and the way Boo's trying to signal as to what she's trying to communicate. In fact, so she's got the, the neural, she, she just can't communicate. It, yes, she's exactly. There and is trapped, but, but so we can't actually be completely sure because the thing is, I mean, up until seven years old, she was perfectly fine. But after that is when it started to get, uh, when the neurological right. sort of damage started to kick in, and now she's around 29 years old. So I, we know that uh, you know the brain activity is there. We know that she's trying to communicate, but she's unable to actually move in the way that would allow her to communicate. But through EEG and through the machine learning technology,
technology that I was talking about, hopefully we can restore at least some kind of intent communication ability so that Boo can communicate concepts like yes, no, not sure, maybe, because even that kind of binary yes, no communication is something that would really help out Boo, and especially when someone like her mom is talking to her. Are we close? I mean, last time you talked about there's, you know, first of all, there's a helmet that you have to wear, and there's big things mm -hmm. like you don't have to shave your head anymore. Yes, which, yes. Which is big for those yeah. that are wearing it. it, it I mean, it talks to the advancement in technology. Oh, yeah. The other thing is it only needed eight channels from I don't mm -hmm. know how many channels we started yes. off with. Are we close? Well, I wouldn't say that we're close, but we've come a long way. We've come a long way, but there's still a long way to go. <laughs> we've got new technology, and well, while I wouldn't use the uh, wording helmet, uh, I would say something like headset. You know, it, it's something uh, like maybe even just a cap that we would wear, uh, and we would be collecting, say, eight, maybe if we really need to, say, 16 channels. But the best part is that, first of all, they're completely dry. Boo does not need to continuously put this really weird conductive gel. Uh, also, Boo doesn't need to have very uncomfortable electric sensors. We're actually working with a company in Dallas called Ipsum Sensors, uh, and they're helping us out with actually creating custom graphene-based sensors. And graphene is basically one atom layer thick of uh, one atom layer thick material made out of graphite. Uh, and so what that means is that it's a superconductor. Uh, it conducts electricity excellently. In fact, it's so conductive, and the sensors are so sensitive uh, that I believe I may have given this example yeah. in the past as well. Yeah. But if I had one of the sensors with me right now, and there were an old electrical socket right there, I would be gathering a few electrons from the air that I would need to filter out from that sensor. Uh, and so, again, very, very wow. sensitive. The technology is great. Will, will this affect other, like ALS, like Stephen Hawking, oh, yeah. if he was around? Is yeah. the same thing? Or? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's just that Stephen Hawking still had a little bit of control over his eye movements, his cheek movements. And when he started to get the disease, he was, I wouldn't say old, but he was relatively older than Boo. And older than you. That's for sure. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and because of that, we were able to uh, communicate with him, figure out how exactly it's going to work, and those cheek and eye movements were working with him. Well, Tom, you know, every time I come in here, I think I hold, I hold my head real high because of all the great things I'm doing, then I hear what you're doing. I'm like, yeah, i gotta get, <laughs> I got to get back to work now. Um, so let's talk about the mental health that you're doing for yes. veterans and teens. And as I recall last time, uh, the, the problem that we have with mental health today is that we diagnose it way too late oh, yeah. in the cycle, whereas mm -hmm. you're trying to use machine learning to get out in front of it to identify the problems before they, they surface, essentially. Exactly. So really, if you take a look at what we're doing for mental health right now, now, just like a, a quick sort of overview, it's something where you're not doing it actively, you're doing it passively. Where let's just say someone is depressed, uh, what we try and do is suicide prevention by, say, hotlines, where if someone is depressed, they will take the initiative to call a helpline, which in most cases, as you can imagine, let's just say you're depressed and, uh, and you're a teenager, you probably wouldn't be comfortable talking to another human on a helpline, and especially taking the initiative to call that human on the helpline and actually try and get help. But through the power of machine learning, though, we can actually solve this uh, two ways. First of all, you no longer need to talk to a human. You're talking to a robot that's there to help you. You're talking to a robot that's there to enable you uh, to feel better, to sort of calm you down, de-escalate your emergency. But at the same time, the actual, uh, the actual application will be taking a more active role in the field of mental health now. So instead of you having to go, if you're depressed, to say one of these suicide prevention hotlines, now the application is going to be tracking you as you do it, as you usually do on your phone, and using services like Watson's Personality Insights that enables me to get quite literally a 360 degree view of who you are based off nothing but say how you write. I can then go ahead and predict sort of changes in your personality, and if there's any sort of a model or something that could hint towards depression, even if you yourself don't know it, I can start hinting and nudging towards you that you might need help, uh, or actually give you that help automatically. And so again, taking a more sort of active role here, and also enabling helplines that already exist to do their job more efficiently. Like for example, again, a statistic that I've given last time, 40% of the calls uh, that come into the helplines in Australia for mental health aren't answered. But now we're actually working with partners like Objective Zero in the US, which is an application platform for veterans to connect, uh, just like these mental health helplines, but for veterans. And we're working with them, taking their anonymous data and enabling neural networks to help help out. So if there's no other human available for you to talk to, you can talk to a machine learning algorithm. And unlike chatbots like, say, Watson Assistant uh, that are hard-coded, where the intents and entities are flexible, but the dialogue is hard-coded, this neural network will actually use the Watson Studio to actually synthesize responses. 
so you don't need to code in manual chatbots. It's really interesting technology, and you're going to be hearing a lot more about how that works really soon. What, when, when, like, what timeline? <laughs> so, you know, I'm always going to get timeline. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to commit to a timeline if you don't like it. But I'm interested, right? Yeah, exactly. So, so i, I got a follow-on question. The 40% go unanswered. Why yes. they go unanswered? They go unanswered because there simply aren't enough humans to answer the calls. Like, for example, uh, if there are tens of thousands of people calling into the helplines, the helplines simply can't afford to pay that's enough. That's not a lot of help, then. Exactly. That's not a lot of help. I mean, of course, 60% they're getting the help they need. Yeah. In fact, 80% of the people that actually call into those helplines say that that saved their life. But still, if 40% of those people's calls aren't answered, that's a huge chunk that's going to waste. And through neural networks, we can do two things. First of all, we can enable them to talk to a machine learning algorithm and de-escalate their emergency, and at the same time, assess the priority of that call. We can see how important is this? Should we bump it up in the queue? Should we take this down compared to this other case? We can do all of that because machine learning enables us to understand what people's problems actually are. The only thing is I would have thought that you would also use machine learning in the social space, because i got to believe that will tell the sentiment of the individual you're talking about mm -hmm. proactively, maybe more than anything else. Mm -hmm. But then I would imagine there's also a data privacy issue that mm -hmm. comes into place there. So are, how are you, mm -hmm. is, is that is that part of the program or? Well, well, you see, this is where the interesting part comes in. So as I mentioned before, before I got into the helplines, I'm also developing applications that take a more active role in diagnosing, say, depression or enabling you to get help quicker. And these active applications are using practically all the data that you're generating on your phone. Like, for example, as you mentioned, social. Uh, for this application, we're going to be taking in practically all your Facebook posts, your Twitter tweets, or whatever else you're comfortable with providing us. We're going to be taking your health kit data from iOS, taking it's taking a look at how much you exercise, where you've been going. We're going to be taking a look at your SMS history. But the thing is, it's not a privacy violation. And in fact, people should feel very comfortable doing this because their data is never being sent to the cloud. That's the interesting part. Because IBM Watson enables me to actually export models to Core ML, I don't need to send anyone's data to the cloud. You could turn off your internet connection, and this would still work perfectly because all of the computations being done on device, no human will ever see that data. And it's also completely encrypted on device. So even in case the sandboxing of iOS does not happen to work, encryption is still protecting all of your data. Well, that kind of aligns with IBM's policy of the data is yours. Absolutely. And, and our paradigm around that versus you know, other competitors and either other companies exactly. that uh, you know, data is king, so they're trying to take as much data as possible. Mm -hmm. But what are you doing, like the case of Facebook or Twitter, you know, mm -hmm. that, that stuff that's out there in the, in the, I don't know, the sphere, so yes. to speak, can we look, are you using that? Can we look at that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And that's actually what this application looks at. Okay. And again, because Facebook and Twitter is unstructured data, because we cannot run directly statistics or analytics on that unstructured data, we could, but it really wouldn't be effective. That's why we're using services like Watson Personality Insights, for example. Being able to take all of, say, their Twitter tweets or posts in the past sort of threshold of days and being able to track changes in their personality over time to be able to graph it out and then use machine learning algorithms from there to predict changes and see how off those changes are from predictions to be able to see uh, wh where exactly this person's personality is going and whether we should be trying to get them help. I'm glad they don't run Watson Personality Insights on me. I don't know. It <laughs> wouldn't be depression, but uh, they, they, I'd get a call, I'm sure. <laughs> um, hey, pause for a minute. With all these initiatives, who's project managing all these things? That's what I want to know. <laughs> how, how do you keep well, it? Somebody's got to be project managing. Yeah. This. So, well, it depends on the project. So, I mean, as I mentioned, with Project Cognitive, for example. Uh, that project is a collaboration between me and my mentor, Timothy Duncan. Yeah. Uh, and so we're basically collaborating on this sort of side by side. Tim's working with you know, the hardware. He's working a little bit with the software. I'm working more on the machine learning, the big data part of things, as you mentioned. With the mental health project, I'm collaborating with a mentor of mine in New Zealand, and of course, one from the US. Their names are Prashant Main and James Archieri. And so basically working with them, uh, and it's, it's again, it's, it's sort of a collaboration where I'm working on machine learning aspects, and they're helping me out. Uh, with all of the other really important aspects that go around, you know, the project and the company and all that sort of stuff. Uh, so it really depends on the individual projects. Some of them are sort of my own sort of personal projects, and some of them, of course, I'm working uh, with 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 a few of my mentors. But do you divide this across your day in terms of making sure you give attention to each oh, one? Yeah, it not, absolutely. Okay. And it also depends. Like for example, if I'm waiting up on on someone for you know data for the mental health project, for example, then that's something I might put on hold for a while, add some more extra time to project cognitive, get that done. In fact, we're actually now working with OpenBCI for 
for a project cognitive open brain computer interface. They're a great company. Uh, they have great sensors and boards. Uh, and we're actually working with them using their hardware. And recently we got a bunch of their hardware and we're starting to see how that works with our software. You know, when you're done with all this technology stuff, you could probably give a lesson on prioritization, I guess, <laughs> as, as well. I can't remember my kids' names and you just shut off all, all these people that you're working with. Great. Uh, so I know you're also working on predicting and preventing uh, negative drug interactions. I think yes. uh, targeted for India. Mm -hmm. So, so I wouldn't necessarily say it's targeted for you know the Indian market, but I'm actually working with a startup uh, in India called Grad Valley Data Science. Uh, so they do they do great work, uh, and they're actually basically trying to bring data science as a topic to tier two and three regions across India. Yep. Uh, so more students in India can use machine learning, but they're also a startup revolving around creating machine learning enabled applications specifically in healthcare, which is of course what I'm very passionate about. Uh, and so I'm actually collaborating with them on a project that basically aims to do drug adverse event prediction. So let's just say uh, you take a drug and you experience a headache 10 minutes later. Now, the drug may have caused the headache, but just because there was correlation between drug and headache doesn't mean there was causation. It doesn't mean that that drug specifically had to have caused the headache. Or maybe it was because you took this drug and another drug within a certain time interval uh, on a certain day at a certain time. Uh, and so all of these factors add up, everything from the dosage to when you're taking it to other drugs you're taking it with. And so you can never really be sure what kinds of adverse events you're going to experience. And even clinical trials don't really get the full dynamic range of the human genome. Like for example, uh, one Alzheimer's drug works perfectly for South Americans, but in North Americans it does nothing just because of the genes. So your genes are different, you will react to drugs differently. And what this application enables us to do is provide clinical researchers a tool so they can actually predict adverse events that people will experience to drugs and map it from drug to adverse event, but also the other way around. Adverse events and the drugs that cause them, the combinations, the pairs that cause them, and what kinds of genes and genetic factors cause them as well. It's a really interesting project. We're collaborating with a few different companies, uh, and I'm sure we'll be hearing a lot more about that soon. Where, where does the data come from, though? I mean, mm -hmm. does it come from the users that are recording their experience after leveraging the drug? It comes mm -hmm. from trials? It comes so, from both, or what? It actually is very, very interesting in terms of the data, because the FDA in the US, as well as the German CIDR database, actually provide this data completely free for any researchers to use. Because legally, when you take certain drugs, you are obligated that if you experience an adverse event, you're supposed to call into a helpline and actually report that adverse event. And right as you report it, it immediately gets logged down in the FDA database, and that database is available for anyone to download, use, and now we're using that with machine learning technology to understand that vast amount of data. See, that's important to me because if you look at it, any, any commercial, it's, a, it's like a joke, right? You see, mm -hmm. they give you the, the, the benefits of said drug, yes. and then the fine line is, well, this could happen, this could happen, and then you, by the time you're done with it, anything's exactly. possible. So if we can predict that and, and get more specific on it, that'd be great. I'm still concerned about where they're getting some of that data because if I get a headache, I'm not usually calling in on it to report that headache. Well, in some cases, you might not call in to report it, but this is the interesting part. A lot of people seem to love sharing what they do on social media. <laughs> yeah, you think? <laughs> yes. Uh, but it's actually surprising when it comes to drugs because if you actually go on Twitter right now and you search up your common drug, you're going to see a lot of people reporting the fact that they feel dizzy from albuterol on Twitter. And so they aren't reporting it to a helpline per se, but they're reporting it on social media. And this is where Watson comes in. Using the Watson Knowledge Studio and the Natural Language Understanding Service, we can actually take unstructured data from social media where people are reporting the adverse events that they experience to drugs like albuterol, and we can extract the entities like the drugs that they took, when they took them, the side effects that they experienced, extract the relationships between those entities, and do that by having medical experts label that training data with almost no machine learning expertise. In fact, no machine learning expertise because we're using the Watson Knowledge Studio. Well, I think even more importantly, it's the interaction between different drugs. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I look at my, you know, I hope my mother-in-law isn't listening, but she is like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and I'm looking at all different colored. It's like a smorgasbord. Of, of whatever she's taken. I can't imagine that they're not interacting with one another. Oh, right? they are. And it's important for us to map those interactions, which is why this machine learning app exists, or that's why we're building it. All right, Fatima, you can cut that part out so I don't get in trouble. <laughs> All right. Uh, so as, a, as another pause here for the folks in the audience, if you're thinking of questions, please think of those questions and or is there a Slack channel that folks can send them to? We don't have one. All right. So just think of the, the questions. So um, I, got, I got a lot more, but Absolutely. I want to make sure others 
you know, get theirs in at the end if they'd like to. So I noticed your shirt. Would you yes. call for code? Call for code. Nice. I like it. I should have had one on. That's that's <laughs> nice. Make me look bad. Now, um, so talk a little, you know, we're, we're supporting or sponsoring uh, Call for Code, which is a multi-year initiative that we're trying to inspire developers to solve mm -hmm. global and world problems. So what is your involvement and uh, where should people go? You know, just give us some color around it. Yeah, sure. So I believe really the Call for Code is an important initiative. Of course, it's something that I'm personally very passionate about because as I mentioned before, for example, my main interest is using machine learning in the field of healthcare, but using machine learning in the field of disaster preparedness is just as important as using it in the field of healthcare. Like for example, every single day over 60,000 people are affected by natural disasters. It, of course it doesn't seem like it's always that many, but every single day, indirectly or directly, maybe even something that happened in the past, there's 60,000 people that are being affected. Now imagine if you could take the data that these 60,000 people are generating every single day and if you could analyze it and actually understand it using machine learning technology, imagine the kinds of applications that you could create. Imagine the kinds of of insights you could get and that's why I'm so interested in projects like the call for code like for example there have been lots of different uh, and really exciting uh, projects that I've seen around the call for code like for example uh, a little while ago in Puerto Rico uh, there was a hackathon around the call for code and there was this really interesting project that one of the teams came up with uh, where basically they would use drones to figure out what needs that people had in a natural disaster affected area and they would enable them uh, to communicate with the drone so the drone can deliver uh, whatever that family or whatever that person needs. It's really interesting technology, and the Call for Code, I believe, is a really important initiative because of the fact that now we can take all so much data and the technology that we have access to, and we can enable people who are affected by natural disasters to be prepared for them. So that when the natural disaster strikes, they're ready, and they can get back on their feet and, uh, and recover from that natural disaster as quickly as they possibly can by making use of the data that they're generating during these natural disasters. We'll put a link to the call for code in the in the show notes so people know where to go and how mm -hmm. to be, become a part of it. Absolutely. Are you contributing to call for code? So unfortunately, I mean, the call for code actually does have sort of like for the team specifically, uh, they do have an 18 sort of uh, age age limit. So I'm unable to actually create a team. Ooh. But I mean, it would be great to have a call for code for the youth. That's an idea for IBM. You should create a call for code for the youth. Uh, but apart from that, uh, I am, of course, as I mentioned, enabling and really helping more developers work with machine learning technology like Watson. And the call for code isn't limited to just machine learning. It's really using all sorts of next generation technologies to enable people to be prepared for natural disasters like IoT, uh, if you can somehow use, you know, for example, DB2, if you can implement DB2 uh, and, uh, and somehow store data more efficiently for machine learning technology. You can use blockchain. There's so many different technologies that you can use in the call for code, enabling people to be more prepared for natural disasters. Uh, and from there, I'm also, uh, apart from just enabling more developers, I'm actually helping them out uh, whenever they experience issues, like for example, through say, uh, the different people that I'm able to help, as I mentioned, my 100,000 goal, the code patterns that I'm creating. In fact, very soon you're gonna be seeing me create a code pattern around Call for Code that's coming out soon. Uh, so you are kind of so contributing to it. I am kind of contributing <laughs> to it. Unfortunately, I can't create an actual hey, code. Rules are meant to be broken, man, that's all right. <laughs> all good. I hope so. So, but let me ask you this though, a related question is, if you're a young programmer out there, are there other areas or other places to contribute to similar mm -hmm. initiatives? To like oh yeah, absolutely. There are tons of different places where you as a programmer can contribute. In fact, really what I believe the best way to contribute to an initiative like this is to create the applications and get them out there. Like for example, uh, let's just say you've got an idea for the next big application that could help someone out in the field of disaster preparedness. Let's just say you're a developer. Even if you haven't used machine learning technology before, even if you haven't used IoT or blockchain before, using the IBM Cloud, you can get set up and running very, very easily. And what I'd recommend for you to do if you're, say, a young developer wanting to contribute to an initiative like this, is really go ahead, uh, implement this application, and just upload it to, say, for example, the iOS App Store. Uh, upload it and create a web application out of it, and enable more and more people to use it. Try and help out as many people as you can through your implementation of these applications. And and again, the best part is that even if you're just a developer that's never worked with machine learning before, you can still use that machine learning technology, IoT, whatever it may be, by using resources like the IBM Cloud, the open source technology that's available on sites like, for example, GitHub. 
So you have a YouTube channel, right? Yes, Tammy Teaches. <laughs> Say it again. Tammy Teaches is the name. All right, of no, Tammy. Tammy te Teaches. Yes. All right, I got it. Does uh, I mean, do you do you give instruction on how to get started out there? Oh yeah, yeah absolutely. And so really, my YouTube channel again is basically targeted towards really anyone that's either a starting to get into programming or starting to get into machine learning, or even if you already have some experience with machine learning technology, enabling you to work with even more advanced technology. Like for for example, uh, and, and of course, it's not even just limited to, say, IBM Watson or, say, Google TensorFlow or Keras. It's really a combination of tons of different technologies. Like, for example, uh, even the code patterns that I create and the videos that I create are around tons of different APIs and SDKs, like IBM Watson, Apple's new Turi Create Deep Learning Library is one that I'm really interesting in, interested in. Uh, of course, we've got Google's TensorFlow and Keras that I mentioned, Microsoft's CNTK. And so, basically, targeting, enabling people to get into this next generation technology but also if they've already started working with it to enable them to work even more with this kind of technology uh, and do more with it. So I got a question for you. This is my question. You know, so I had a podcast not long ago. It was one of my, my favorite. It was uh, called Clicker or Coder. Okay. And uh, it was with Des and Business Over Broadway Bob. Yeah, so if you want to listen to it, go back there. And I think it was called Clicker or, or Coder, wasn't it? Yes. So um, it's really a data scientist or a coder. And the premise there was you can't really be both. I mean, there's a re it's a team sport. You know, a, a coder gives to the data scientist the data they can trust. Mm -hmm. And the clickers get the value, and they find the good things from the value to help the coder get to where they need to be. I mean, yes. you've got like a domain expert, maybe a, st a statistician, and then you've mm -hmm. got the coder. Yes. It's kind of like, I don't know if there's an analogy, probably a bad analogy, but people that manufacture the car aren't the race car drivers. I mean, those yes. are two different disciplines, if you will. But my question is, which one are you? <laughs> you see, well, are you an exception to the rule? Are you both? <laughs> well, uh, first of all, I wouldn't say necessarily exception to the rule. I would say this is a rule that you could say, you know, you can't be both, you can't be a clicker and a coder, but at the <laughs> same time, of course, it's much more efficient if you have two different people, you know, one is the data scientist, one is the coder, but I think it's important at least for the data scientist to be slightly involved in the code and for the coder to be slightly involved in the data science. The reason I say that is let's just say uh, I'm a data scientist and, and let's just say that I love working with you know the different machine learning algorithms. I like to go into the data. Uh, I like to figure out you know different kinds of patterns in data. I, I love to basic, of course, whatever a data scientist does. But let's just say uh, that I'm doing, you know, uh, I'm doing whatever I'm doing with my data. But at the same time, I have an idea as to how I could make this process more efficient. If I'm not on the coding side of things, then there's no way I can contribute back into and enable this whatever I'm doing to become more efficient. And same thing with the code. If you have an idea for what the data scientist could do better, if you're not involved in the data science aspect at all, then there's really no way that you can help out that data scientist do whatever they're trying to do more efficiently. So really what I believe is that it's a good combination of both. Uh, it's much more efficient if you have a team of people working together anyway. Of course, it's always more efficient mm -hmm. to distribute the work as much as you can until, of course, it becomes too large. Uh, but then again, if you don't have some kind of overlap in between, then that's a little bit of communication that's just being locked, and that's a lot of efficiency. Uh, that's a lot of new ideas that aren't being transferred, that aren't being shared between the coder, the programmer, and the data scientist. So really what I love to do is sort of a good combination between both uh, of both of these topics. I love going to the machine learning. I love using services like Watson Studio, but at the same time, I love implementing that kind of thing. And if you think about it, machine learning is really, say, 30, 40, maybe 40 percent code, and the majority of it is the data science. It's going through the data, figuring out what it's about, figuring out why your machine learning architecture isn't working, uh, trying to decipher what it's actually thinking about and makes an inference. All of that is what may takes the majority of your time and less of it in the actual code that goes behind it. I think you just told me you're the unicorn. You're the one that does both, right? <laughs> Because I know you code, right? Yes. You code a lot, 50% of your time, yeah. something like that. Mm -hmm. But you're studying data science as well. Absolutely. Yes. So you're trying to do both one way. That, that's good. Exactly. You can do it. You can do it. Um, keeping on that same thread, let's talk a little bit about open source. 
I'd like to kind of get your view on recent trends and what your involvement is. I got to believe, since you're the coder that you talk about, that yes. are you creating some open source libraries out there? Oh yeah, use? absolutely. Of course you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In fact, the majority of all my projects actually are actually are open source projects. If you take a look at Project Cognitive, if you take a look at the Mental Health Project, there are certain portions of those projects that are completely open source and available for practically anyone to download, do whatever they want to, contribute, modify. Of course, all the applications on the App Store of mine are completely open source, for example. My YouTube channel, all that is open source. All the applications in my book are open source. Uh, and so really, my involvement in the open source community is basically uh, what I love to do. It's creating different machine learning applications and enabling more developers to work with machine learning. Because again, machine learning is a great technology, but unless we have enough people working with it, it's really not all that helpful. And that's why I love working with, for example, say Watson or Apple's new Create ML library. Uh, because they enable developers, maybe even developers that have never worked with machine learning before, they enable them to actually take the data that their application and maybe the tens of thousands of users that they have are generating and actually make use of it. Like for example, up until now, it was so difficult to incor incorporate machine learning in your apps that barely any app on the App Store had machine learning in it. But now, since it's so easy due to Watson and CoreML, now you can see practically all the applications on the App Store integrating machine learning. Even if you take a look at, like, for example, Snapchat, uh, it's using machine learning with augmented reality on the new iPhone 10 to do extremely advanced facial tracking and apply stickers or, or masks or whatever to your face. Uh, so there's so many different examples of machine learning being applied here. And really, even the proprietary implementations of machine learning, like Create ML, are really only possible because of the open source community. If it weren't for the open source community developing libraries like TensorFlow and enabling researchers to work with deep learning in an efficient way, if it weren't for libraries like Apple's Tilly Create, enabling developers to create applications that are able to leverage billions of rows of data at once on a small machine, and if it weren't for libraries like Keras that enable beginners to get into deep learning architectures, without all of this, there simply wouldn't be enough of a community. There wouldn't be enough uh, uh, people really out there, quite literally, working with machine learning, deep learning technology because of the open source community, even proprietary implementations of AI exist today. So it's here to stay a long time. Absolutely. Good. I'm, I'm an advocate. I want to transition into Watson, and then mm -hmm. I'll finish with Power AI. And that transition is really about something we talked about last time, which was data democracy. Yes. Um, the democratization of data. And that was a, an interesting topic last time because the more data, particularly when you're talking healthcare, mm -hmm. the better we're able to make decisions. I want to get your perspective again, and then I'll ask you some questions on, on Watson. But since it's your area of passion, mm -hmm. do we have the corpus of data we need? And where do you think we need to go, if and or not, to get that corpus of data? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so it really depends on the specific field that you're talking about, I, I, I believe. And let's just say we take the example of healthcare, right? So in the field of healthcare, and really each field has its own concerns as to how much data you might need to collect. Like for example, in the field of healthcare, if you're trying to detect cancer cells, maybe 10,000 rows of data is nothing. But maybe in the field of, say, accounting or auditing, maybe 10,000 rows of data is quite a bit. And then maybe in the field of visual recognition or some random field, uh, 10,000 rows of data is a lot of data. So it's a different scale for each field you go in. Uh, however, let's just take a specific example of healthcare. Now, in terms of data democratization, really what I believe, and something that I've actually mentioned again time and time again, is that I believe it's really important for more people to have access to data, more people to have access to machine learning algorithms, APIs, SDKs that enable them to work with machine learning algorithms on the data that they have. Like for example, let's just say I have made an app to the Apple, uh, App Store uh, five years ago. In those five years, I've collected a lot of data, but it's sitting there doing nothing because I as a human can't go through all that data and try and analyze what it means. It's impractical for me to go through hundreds of thousands of tweets or tens of thousands of product reviews or any of the, anything of that sort, which is why we need machine learning 
learning algorithms, and we need it to be simple enough, we need it to be accessible enough for more and more people to be able to use it. Like, for example, if you take a look at the Watson Studio, hyperparameter optimization is something that takes a long time when you're developing neural networks, when you're developing deep learning technology. You have to figure out what loss values to use, you have to figure out what optimizers to use, you have to figure out the learning rate, the number of epochs you want to go through, the early stopping, all the callbacks, all these things take up a lot of time and a lot of experimentation. But when you're working with powerful technology like Watson Studio, you focus on the architecture, Watson Studio focuses on all that optimization, enabling your neural network architecture to really shine and show what it does best, which is working with that specific corpus of data. But talking about data in specific though, uh, getting back to sort of the data democratization point, I do believe it is really critical for us to enable more access to data. Like for example, if you take a look at the field of healthcare, there's still a few concerns that people have around their data being collected. Like for example, my Apple Watch. Right now it's collecting my heartbeat information and it's sending it over to medical researchers so they can actually use it. But because of the fact that Apple puts in different sorts of uh, steps in place, like for example, differential privacy, adding mathematical noise to my heartbeat to enable it so that no one else can actually trace that back to me. No one can say, hey, this was Tanmay's heartbeat or this was this user ID's heartbeat. Do, because they put those steps in place, I'm comfortable with sharing that data. So really solving some key challenges like the privacy problem, people need to be comfortable sharing their data, enabling it to work more efficiently with machine learning algorithms. I think these are challenges we still need to solve. But again, making it so that more people have access to that data is something that I believe is really important. It's going to be tough, though. It people is have to challenges. give up their data. Hey, I buy into uh, it. I get. I just gave my DNA to 23andMe. I see. That's I, great. I haven't heard back yet. Oh, okay. I, I would picture them sitting back there going, oh my God, <laughs> trying to figure this out. They've got all the researchers right now looking at it. I, I don't know what's taking so long. Anyway, Watson, two more questions. Um, now, Watson was released with a lot of fanfare. Yes. Yes. Uh, it's not brand new anymore. You got to train it. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes there's negative press on it, and there's a lot of positive press mm -hmm. uh, oncology or, or whatnot. Do you see that the, relative to, to the time you've been involved with it? You're a huge fan, I know. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, is the pace what you would have expected? Oh, absolutely. Especially when it comes to the APIs on the IB, on IBM Cloud, it's something that I think has really evolved quite rapidly over the past few years. Like for example, two years ago when I started using. Uh, Watson and when Alchemy had just been sort of started to absorb, uh, was starting to be absorbed uh, into the IBM Cloud, which was what was then called Bluemix. Um, and so really nowadays, if you take a look, the, the evolution of Watson, it's been huge. Uh, two years ago, you could train uh, Watson on some specific services, like they started to have their visual insights, if you remember that service, and visual recognition. Uh, they have the natural language classifier and a few other services. Uh, but you weren't able to train, for example, custom models for NLU, or what was then called relationship extraction. Uh, you weren't able to create your own custom deep learning architectures and training on your own data. Uh, but nowadays, using the Watson Studio, you can do that. Using the Watson Machine Learning Service, you can upload your own neural network architectures, your own code, and use that code on the IBM Cloud on your own compute environment uh, that you choose. Uh, so I can definitely say that the evolution of Watson and its APIs has been huge. Uh, and really, what I believe that the core sort of concepts as to why uh, I sort of, you know, started to use Watson in the first place have, have really stunk, and if anything, they've just gotten better. Like for example, two years ago, or actually now I believe it would be four years, four years ago when I started to use uh, IBM Watson, uh, the reason I chose to continue to use IBM Watson, of course, there'll be the flexibility of it, and you can train custom models, but at the same time, it's really easy to use. It's not too easy to the point that I can't customize it, but it's not so customizable that I always need to provide my own architecture and uh, hyperparameter optimization variables and all that kind of stuff. It was in that kind of sweet spot where I could use my own data uh, with my own sort of preferences. Uh, and that still holds up today. I can still use the Watson Studio with my own data. And if anything, I can use Watson Studio with my own data, but at the same time, customize it. I can use the Watson Knowledge Studio to train NLU custom models. I can use Discovery and enrich my data the way I want to. There's so many different things that are possible with this, uh, and I can definitely see that the evolution has, has really gone in the right direction. All right, great. That was a good answer, by the way. I like it. <laughs> so I, I want to open it up, but I want you to say something. I don't want to be remiss and not say something about Power AI, because I know 
a big mm -hmm. proponent of it. Absolutely. I'll open it up after this question, but uh, Power AI, why are you such a big proponent of it? What's it doing for you? <laughs> sure. So, I mean, really, the reason that I'm so passionate about Power AI is especially, let's go back to the data point that we were talking about. When you've got huge amounts of data, it becomes quite difficult to train machine learning, deep learning algorithms with it. Like, for example, five, just five years ago, if you want to train a deep learning system on ImageNet, you would have to use AlexNet, and even that tiny AlexNet neural network had to be split onto two different GPUs. Nowadays, though, you can train like three different instances of AlexNet on the same GPU, and you can fit eight GPUs into one machine, and you can fit two Power9 processors onto the same machine. So we've seen a huge evolution uh, in this computing power, but now that data sets are getting so big, uh, now data sets are getting so big to the point that it's even a barrier to transfer the data from CPU memory to GPU memory. And that's just one example. But Power AI enables NVLink, which would allow a direct interconnect between CPU memory, GPU memory, to instantly transfer, almost instantly transfer that data, 300 gigabytes per second, very, very fast. So that's just one of the examples. There's also the fact that the power architecture in general has numerous advantages over x86. The threads per core, uh, the clock speed, all of this adds up uh, to enabling you to do more machine learning in a faster way, no matter what your data sets are or how big they are. Dude, you're amazing. <laughs> hey, any questions from the audience? I've asked, I got more, but I'm gonna settle. No questions? Oh, I know Glenn would have a question. <laughs> All right, Glenn, what's up, man? Do I need that? All right. Thanks, Kate. Uh, a question relates to uh, data capture, data gathering. So you talk about large data sets, and I wonder, uh, is there a place in machine learning where data capture, data gathering fits? Because uh, you may take a data set, like you said, one of the data sets was uh, they know the, the drug interactions. Mm -hmm. But uh, could you capture more of that data? Does that fit within kind of your project space mm -hmm. or, or other people working on that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So the data capture is actually one of the key components of it. Uh, it's not something that I highlighted, uh, but like for example with Project Cognitive, even just the methodology with which we capture data has to be just right in order to make sure that there's no noise in the data, uh, that we're getting real data that won't give us any sort of false predictions, uh, give us any false hopes that, hey, the accuracy is so high, oh wait, we're using the wrong kind of data, and apparently it's all the same kind of thing. So like for example with Project Cognitive, we need to make sure that we're collecting data to begin with in a very sort of uh, standard way. We need to have a a, a kind of standard method with which we collect data, which we're still actually working on figuring out what the best way is to do that. Uh, do we want to have just one controlled environment where we do this, or do we want to have it in variable settings so your EEG is always a bit different? We're still trying to do that kind of experimentation, but even if you take a look at other projects, like for example, the Mental Health Project, the data collection is definitely a huge part of that. In fact, with the Mental Health Project, it's actually the main part of that. Uh, like for example, we've got tons of different crisis texts. You know, we've got the crisis this text line. We've got Objective Zero that's helping us out. We've got tons of different companies that exist uh, and that we could partner with. But the entire sort of challenge there is making sure that the data is anonymous. How can you make sure that people are comfortable with us actually taking that data? How can you make sure that just the fact that we take that data won't reduce the amount of interactions that people have with that website? Uh, and so there are lots of different aspects that go around that. Unfortunately, it's something, not something that I had already uh, shed light upon. But yes, the data gathering and capturing is, if anything, the most important part because if you're not collecting good data, you're not going to get good output. Garbage in, garbage out, of course. Uh, that's, 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 the, that's the ground rule uh, when it comes to this. So data capturing is the first step and it's one of the most important steps. And may I bet you can't guess where Glenn, what is his responsibility is, can you? What is it? Data capture, of course. <laughs> He's looking for good things said about data capture. I think he did well. All right. Yeah. Is there another one? Hi, I had, I'm Sarah. I had a question about um, the uh, mental health helpline project yes. that you're talking about. It sounds like it's um, somewhat similar to the Here For You project that we have running through IBM. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us, is there a partnership between the two or are they, um, they running separately? So currently they're running, well, separately, although I have actually heard of the Here For You initiative and I have actually talked with a few of the people uh, that know about that uh, specific initiative. Unfortunately, though, I haven't been able to connect with them very 
much. But then again, any help in terms of you know data or the algorithms would really be appreciated since you know we're still trying to work towards actually collecting that data for people to work with. So that's definitely something that I would love to collaborate on. Uh, and if, if if someone's watching right now, that's uh, that's part of the Here for You initiative. Uh, I'd love to get in touch. Uh, so apart from that, though, you no, know, we're not currently sort of collaborating per se. But I have talked with a few of the people um, that are related to Here for You. In fact, when I was going to think, uh, there was a very similar talk to mine on Here for You. So I was able to connect with uh, with some of the people there. Unfortunately, not formally collaborating yet. But hopefully, that would be a, that would that, that that that's definitely a possibility and would be really interesting. Because again, the more we collaborate and work together instead of working on separate algorithms and separate projects, the better. Nice. Thank you. Another one. Shake. So let's say you built a very good model. You're happy with this. You're taking this to the users. They're asking you, uh, OK, here is the prediction for a model. Explain to me why mm -hmm. the model has predicted this. Yes. How do you handle the interpretability of the model? Yeah, sure. So this is where Power AI comes in again. <laughs> uh, so of course, Power AI, not as the platform, the toolkit, but sp a specific product called Power AI Vision. Now, let's just say I build an image classification model. Now, this image classification model uh, tells me, is there a bird in this image or not. Uh, now, it's a very, very simple task. Or maybe you could even expand that and say, is there a bird in this image? If so, which kind of bird is it? Which species of bird is it? Now, if a, if a user were to ask me which part of this image told the neural network that, hey, there's a bird in here, you might presume that, hey, the bird told the neural network that there's a bird here. But because it's a neural network, you can't be sure. But with Power AI Vision, they actually use something called a GradCam algorithm in order to provide heat maps of where the neural network was actually activated the most, which pixels activated the neural network the most, and therefore you can tell the importance of all the sections in the image. Uh, and this also sheds some light on the fact that, for example, neural networks, if they see a bird, the bird might not be the thing that they're focusing on. They could be focusing on, hey, is there a branch over here with something on it? If so, then it's probably a bird. Like, for example, Microsoft, a little while ago, took one of their state-of-the-art neural networks, ResNet, residual neural networks, and they actually trained it sorry, uh, on the ImageNet data set, uh, and they tried to detect sheep. And they found out that if they were to feed in uh, uh, a person on a really grassy landscape, it would detect sheep even though there are no sheep, because it's associating certain concepts of grass person to sheep. Um, and so if they were to just get just the right image without even modifying the image, they would be able to get that. So there are tons of different ways to do that. Of course, they're still relatively primitive, like GradCam doesn't tell you exactly what the neural network works thinking. There's a tension, like for example, in neural machine translation, like for example, Watson language translation. You could do attention is all you need algorithms. Uh, there are tons of different techniques. It's still something that needs to be worked on, because deep learning is more of an art than a science right now, especially when it comes to designing architectures. Uh, there's no way you can train a neural network and then decipher exactly what it learned. You can have a good idea, but you cannot decipher exactly what it is mathematically. So that's still something that people are working on, and I'm sure there are lots of teams at IBM Research working on it as well. I got at least one more question from you, or for you, <laughs> that was given to me, and I got to make sure I get this out. Um, it's a little bit difficult to, let me see if I can articulate it. When you first started exploring Watson, you would have reached a conclusion to use it based on certain criteria. Mm -hmm. If you apply that same set of criteria now, is your conclusion still the same? Mm -hmm. Do you follow it? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So that's actually something that I believe I did mention. When okay. I originally started using Watson, really a few of the keys that told me, hey, use Watson, I mean, first of all, of course, it was the very first machine learning application I'd ever stumbled upon, and it immediately fascinated me. It was like I was enlightened to this whole new world of computing that I never knew existed. Um, and it really sort of reinstated all that sort of faith that I had lost in technology when I stumbled upon Watson. And when I continued to use it, and I found out about all the other APIs that exist out there, I realized that some of the key factors that make Watson special are, again, the perfect balance between customizability and ease of use. You don't want something that's so customizable that you cannot, you cannot use it intuitively. But at the same time, it shouldn't be so easy to use like Google Natural Language that you can't train your own models without having a completely customizable version. Here, though, everything is right in the middle. Want to use a, custom, want to use a model already made by IBM? Use the Natural Language Understanding Service. 
users? Do you want to detect custom entities in your own domain specific use case? Use the Watson Knowledge Studio and don't specify model definition. Do you want to specify a custom model definition? Use the Watson Studio. Do you want to specify your hyperparameters? No problem, you can do that. So it's perfectly customizable and there are these sorts of levels you can get to. And if anything, that's only been amplified in the past three, four years that I've been working with Watson. Fantastic. Hey, I got it. One more. You got a speech coach? You got to have a speech coach, right? <laughs> well, uh, no, I actually don't have a sort no, of speech coach. Per se. Just... I guess so. I mean, I've yeah. been doing this since I was like nine years old. Um, and so, yeah, I, I guess you could say, yeah, wow. it's just experience. Impressive, man. <laughs> Fatima's got a question. We have a question from Facebook. Uh, tell me, what are your future plans in the field of healthcare? All right, sure. So, my future plans in the field of healthcare, of course, as I mentioned, healthcare is the one field that I'm most passionate about continuing to work on these projects is definitely a priority for me. But there are also lots of other really interesting projects. More specifically, there's a new project that I'm working on that you'll hear more about very soon. Uh, and it's actually around developmental disorders uh, for the brain. Uh, and so, uh, again, it's actually using EEG uh, and actually this time providing electrical stimulus back to your body. Uh, and unfortunately, while I'm not, I cannot talk uh, too much about exactly what the project is just yet, uh, but there, there's some really interesting stuff that I'm working on around that. Uh, of course, what I am aiming to do as sort of like a priority is getting, for example, project cognitive to a level where we can actually start to see some kinds of patterns in people's EEG. Uh, of course, there's actually one more area of project cognitive. Of course, we're making this work for, uh, you know, for example, animals like humans and, and other kinds of animals. But there's also an entirely separate, um, uh, separate sort of path that we're going down project cognitive around plants um, and trying to understand electric uh, impulses within plants and, and basically like for example nowadays we've got automatic watering systems which are very very simple they just measure soil moisture UV uh, levels that kind of thing but how can you actually understand what the plant needs at the moment uh, is what we're working on as well so there are tons of different projects in the field of healthcare that I'm working on uh, and so of course one in the field of developmental disorders in the brain that you'll be hearing more about soon uh, collaborating with a German company on that one uh, and apart from that uh, also a project, uh, expanding project cognitive and getting this mental health and project cognitive to a level where we actually start to see some patterns. Listen, dude, you're impressive. Thank uh, you. I hope your family's keeping you level. They're keeping you level? I hope. <laughs> yes, I've met them. Yes. They're great, good people. They so are. That, that, that's, that's terrific. Well, thank you for joining us today. Look, glad to be I here. Like to, now I've got to take all this. I've got to re-listen and, and put all the notes down so I can uh, learn from it. But thank you so much. I appreciate it. Glad to be here. Thank all you right. very much. I'm, I'm glad thank you're you. on our side. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Well, fantastic. Thanks for listening to, to Making Data Simple. And uh, as always, the listeners out there, if you've got any ideas in terms of uh, topics that you'd like to hear, send it to us and we'll put them on the list. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening to the Making Data Simple podcast, where we make data fun. Be sure to visit ibmbigdatahub.com forward slash podcasts to access the show notes and uncover even more great episodes. Remember, the views expressed here are those of the host and its guests and do not necessarily represent the views of IBM. Until next time, over and out. <laughs>